have fun? Does it ever happen? Man, I tell you what, we just have a good time around here. If this is your first time, I want to say welcome. A lot of new faces this morning. I can turn around the room and see somebody that I don't know, which is pretty cool. Uh, my name is Sean. I have the honor of being the pastor here at Dad's house. Uh, and so we, uh, we're so glad that you are here this morning. I know that some of our friends and family who are here today are Spanish speaking. So we say, Bienvenidos en el nombre de Jesus Cristo. Uh, bienvenidos a la casa de Padre. Amen. Amen, amen. Um, I almost said aloha at the end. I've lived too many places. <laughs> I have lived too many places. That's, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> guy named Bob. Uh, not, not Bob, Bob. Where's Bob, Bob? No, there's Bob. A uh, guy named Bob, uh, went, he, he got off work on a Friday. And he, uh, he decided that instead of going home and taking the paycheck that he just got uh, back home to his family, he decided to go out and blow it all weekend with his friends. And so he went out partying all weekend long, and he came home on Sunday night to a very angry wife. And his wife spent about two hours yelling and screaming and telling him what a horrible person he was. And he just stood there and took it. And she didn't like the fact that he wasn't saying anything. And so she looked at him and she said, Bob, how would you like it if you didn't see me for the next two or three days? And he said, well, that would be fine by me. Well, Monday came and he didn't see his wife. Tuesday came and he didn't see his wife. Wednesday came, and he didn't see his wife. And by Thursday, the swelling had gone just enough down in his eye that he's able to make her out just a little bit. Oh, that's terrible. Terrible, terrible. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your presence today. Thank you, Jesus, <laughs> that you don't tell bad jokes. Uh, we love you, Father, and we thank you for your presence in this place today. We thank you, Dad, that your heart is for us, your heart is toward us, that you are always reaching out and pulling us close, drawing us into your embrace, that you are never not a father. There is never a moment when we come to you and you say, today I'm God. Today I feel like being judgy judger. No, every day you are good, good father. And we thank you that you welcome us into your embrace. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that not only do you love us who are here in this room, but we thank you that you love Yakima. That your heart is for our city. Your heart is for our region. Your heart is for our world. And you have brought us together in this room. Not so that we could just enjoy you and enjoy each other, but so that we would get fired up for showing our city what it looks like to be loved by a good, good father. So thank you for encouraging us today. Thank you for inspiring us today. Thank you for reminding us today how much you love us, how much you're for us, and how that's never, ever going to change. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Last week, we dug into a little bit what it looks like to, uh, to, to go after the kingdom. We talked about how important it is not to go out and try and live in our own holiness, but to step into his holiness. That we don't have to do holy things as much as we need to be in the one who is holy. We're called to put on Christ. The Bible doesn't say that we do the righteousness of God in Christ. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And so I want to dig into that a little bit more this morning and talk about what it looks like to release the kingdom wherever we go. We know that we have been given a mandate to preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and cleanse lepers. That's a pretty cool job description, amen? Yeah. Jesus gave us a promise on top of that. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So not only am I calling you to do something, but I'm promising that I'm going to go with you. We've been given the precedent because Jesus said that anyone who believes in me will do the things that I am doing and greater things than these. And we've been given resources. Jesus said, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses. So there's no reason why we can't do this thing. 
There's no reason why we can't step out of this building and step into our normal everyday lives and do everything that Jesus said that we can do. Jesus isn't waiting on the world to come here. Jesus is waiting for us to go there. We don't have to wait for Jesus because he already set the stage and he left the instructions. So the spotlight is on the church, and it's on me right now. That is pretty bright. Um, and so the kingdom is here. It's not our job to defend it. It's our job to advance it. You never win a game by only defending your position. At some point, you have to, you have to score, and that requires advancing on the enemy. So I want you to open up your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 2. <laughs> We're going to hang out in Daniel a little bit this morning. If you're struggling this election season, I would challenge you to read Daniel. Because if you are struggling, you will feel horrible about yourself struggling. And you'll see, no. <laughs> you'll see everything that Daniel did as a mighty man of God who lived at a horrible time in a horrible place, but did more as a servant than Nebuchadnezzar could have ever done as a king. Let that sink in. But that's not what we're talking about today. Say this with me this morning. The Word of God, Word of God is my catalyst, my catalyst for personal reformation, for personal and, reformation total transformation. and total transformation. As it invades my heart, it invades my heart. permeates my soul, permeates my soul. I, carry I carry revival, I release the kingdom, I release the kingdom. and I walk in my identity. Child of, God. Child of God. Daniel chapter 2, starting at verse 31. This is what it says. It says, Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. And while you were watching, a rock was cut out. I want you to pay attention to that. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. And it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Skip down to verse 44. It says, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. Yeah. That will never be destroyed, no, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Now, this morning, we could spend a whole lot of time talking about the entire dream. And honestly, I wish we had time to talk about the entire dream. But here's what I want to be clear about this morning. This prophecy of Daniel was fulfilled when Jesus came. Jesus is the rock that was cut out of the mountain, not by human hands. Yes. If you read your school history books, then you'll read about a time when the Roman uh, Empire was still going on. You read about the reign of Caesar Augustus, who reigned from 14 B.C. to 27 A.D. And during his reign, he set up ten kings within the Roman Empire in order to bring the divided kingdom together. It was, the, it was called the Divided Roman Empire. And there were ten kings who came together and reigned during that time in order to quell some of the rebellion. And these are the feet of iron that were mixed with clay, or the ten toes, the ten kings over each province. And it was also during the reign of Caesar Augustus that a man named Jesus Christ was born. And he was the rock that would crash into the feet and institute a new kingdom that would last forever. The Bible tells us about Jesus that he is the stone 
that the builders rejected, that he is the stumbling stone in Zion, that he's the rock that followed the people in the wilderness, and that he is the chief cornerstone. And this rock arrives in the day of the ten kings that Daniel prophesied about 500 years earlier, and what does he spend all of his time talking about? What does Jesus spend all of his time talking about? He talks about a kingdom. And if he brought the kingdom that Daniel was talking about, then it's a kingdom that the Bible says is never going to end. Now, now I, don't, I don't want you to get me wrong. I don't believe that the kingdom is simply here, period. I believe that the kingdom is here both now and not yet. So we have it because Jesus instituted it, but we also know that there's coming a day when Jesus is coming back and he's going to set up his rule and reign. And so I believe that we are in it, and yet it is still progressing. John the Baptist was very clear. He said that uh, 2,000 years ago, he said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You can't say something is at hand and then have 2,000 years go by and it still hasn't happened yet. That's like me saying, I'm going to go to the store soon, and 10 years later, I still haven't gone. <laughs> right? Wow. It doesn't make a lot of sense. The kingdom was at hand 2,000 years ago, and Jesus began preaching it and releasing it and instituting it. Yes. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. Jesus is talking about a really cool guy named John the Baptist. And he says this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. He says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let him hear. What should I think about this? El Elijah was a mighty man of God who did many, many miracles. John the Baptist was a mighty man of God who, to our knowledge, did none. And yet Jesus says that he was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, that he was greater than them all. But then he goes on and he says that whoever is least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Now, this is weird. Why is Jesus... Setting up a hierarchy. <laughs> I don't think that Jesus was setting up a caste system by any means, but I do believe this. I don't believe that he was saying that John the Baptist was least because he wasn't important. I believe that he was saying that John the Baptist is the least in the kingdom because he was the first in the kingdom of many that would come after. See, John the Baptist served to transition us. In fact, John himself said, he said, I must decrease so that he may increase. John wasn't just being super spiritual. He was also signifying that a new superior covenant was coming. John called himself the friend of the bridegroom. What does the friend of the bridegroom do? He stands in transition as witness to the bridegroom who is coming for the bride. In Jewish tradition, the friend of the bridegroom, who was the, he was the one that would run through the streets yelling, Behold, the bridegroom cometh! When it was time for the bride to come out and meet the groom. He was a man of transition. He was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, and yet least or first in the kingdom of a new covenant. Not because he wasn't important, but because he stood at the beginning. So what does that say about you and me 2,000 years down the road? 2,000 years have gone by, and the Bible says that the kingdom continues to grow. See, we're not, we're not in competition with old covenant prophets. There are a lot of great miracles, a lot of amazing things that took place in the old covenant. But what they had was external. The Bible says that, that God would come on them. But the Bible tells us that Holy Spirit would come on us, but he wouldn't just come on us, he would fill us. So what they had was external, but what we have is internal. It's in here. 
And it's permanent. It's not something that comes and goes, but it's a permanent indwelling of the Spirit of God. The order has shifted and heaven is now inside us. Because Jesus didn't die to get you there. He died to get there here. The people of the Old Covenant, they had manna in the wilderness, but we carry Jesus, the bread of life. They had the Ten Commandments, but the Bible says that the law is, is written on our hearts. They had the temple, but the Bible says that we are the temple. Yeah. They had the rod of Aaron that bloomed overnight, but we have a cross that Jesus resurrected from and Amen. provided Come eternal on. life. Amen. We have a greater reality. Yeah. I would love to see the drama of the Old Covenant. That would be cool, but we can't undermine or devalue the fact that the kingdom we live in is a greater kingdom. It's easy to say that we want to see fire fall from heaven, but we probably don't want to face 400 demon-possessed prophets of Baal in order to experience that, right? <laughs> like, the fire's cool, but do you want to go through everything else in order to get there? <laughs> so Jesus' rock crashes into the earth. The rock not made. Do you, know, do you know how cool this is? This is amazing. The church, the early church, it took them like 300 years to come up with a term called hypostatic union. And hypostatic union means that they began to believe, they began to declare, well, they believed it, but they didn't have a word for it. They began to, to say that what Jesus was was 100% God, 100% man. It took them 300 years to come up with that after the resurrection. Daniel figured it out 500 years before he was born when he said that the rock that comes out of the mountain and is hewn, not with human hands. So you have the incarnation. You have his nature as man, but it's not from human hands. Yeah. Daniel got it before anybody else did. Daniel got it before Jesus even shows up. And it's so cool. In the ancient world, you, uh, you, you have a, a treaty between two nations. And the king comes, and when the king shows up, he says, I'm going to show you what my kingdom is like. And so I'm going to bring spices. I'm going to bring animal skins. I'm going to bring the women that are in my culture. I'm going to bring jewelry. And I'm going to demonstrate my kingdom to you. <clears throat> what does Jesus do when he shows up on scene? He spends three and a half years demonstrating the kingdom. And he says, in my kingdom, we don't have sick people. So I'm going to heal the sick. And in my kingdom, we don't have dead people, so I'm going to raise them up. And in my kingdom, when somebody's hungry, we make sure that they have food. And if the food isn't there, we just multiply what we have in order to get more of it. Because my kingdom is a greater kingdom, and I'm here to bring peace from a good, good father. So let me show you what my kingdom looks like. Yes. I want you to look at, at Luke 22 with me. He demonstrates his kingdom. The people are healed. People are raised from the dead. The demonized are set free. Those in bondage are released. But why? Just in order to say, yep, that's what my kingdom looks like. Good luck until you die. No, Luke 22, something pretty cool happens. Luke 22, 29, he's talking to his, to his disciples and he says, and I confer on you a kingdom. See, a lot of people think the kingdom hasn't come yet, but Luke 22, 29 kind of throws that whole thing off. He says, I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus doesn't say it's coming. He doesn't say you'll get this when you're dead. He says, I confer on you a kingdom. The kingdom of God is a present reality, and it's given to us to steward. The rock crashed into the earth, and it's been growing into a great mountain ever since. Jesus clarifies this even further when he says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that starts out small, but eventually fills the entire earth. Or the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that starts out small, but gradually works its way through the entire earth. Dough. The kingdom is progressive, and it has been progressing for 2,000 years. If you want to, you can let yourself get really negative. You can get really fearful, especially in the, uh, the, the, the season that we're living in. 
Or you can look through the lens of the kingdom and you can realize that it is our job to answer the problems that we are facing with the kingdom of God. Amen. That's why on November 8th, I'm going to do my duty. I'm going to vote for our next president. But I've been voting for you, church, for a way longer time. Because I believe that our answer is not about one man who's going to step up or one woman who's going to step up and make all the difference. I believe that it takes us stepping up and making the difference. When we step into our role as kingdom ambassadors for the rock that is continually growing into the mountain that is taking over the earth, we will see transformation. Let me tell you something this morning. Christianity is not going downhill. The kingdom is advancing. The only reason that we can't see it is because we put the responsibility on the institution rather than the individual person. God isn't interested in saving an organization. Should I say that again? God is not interested in saving an organization. Hallelujah. He's after sons and he's after daughters. And it is sons and daughters who are going to do the transforming of cultures. And you've got a place in that. Every single one of you has a place in that. The youngest person here has a place in that. The oldest person here has a place in that. I don't care who you are. I don't care who your story, what your story is. I don't care what you've done right. I don't care what you've done wrong. I don't care what your story is. You have a part in the kingdom. And we, as a church, are here to help you cultivate that. Because the church is only one aspect of how the kingdom is released throughout the world. God's desire is to bring the kingdom into the education system. He wants to bring the kingdom into the media, into the government, into arts and entertainment, into family and business. And there are people who say, well, let all those people come to church. No. The church gets to go into those arenas because the church is not an organization that everybody meets up in. The church is you. The church is me. Right. And it's not where we go in. It's where we go out. Right. Right. I'm, not, I'm not qualified to release the kingdom of God. That's okay. Holy Spirit is way overqualified. <laughs> so it's, it's all good. It's totally cool. I love Joel. I was talking to Joel the other night. We were a small group. And he said, you know what? I love when I go out and I'm doing ministry. And I love when I get uncomfortable. Because if I'm not, if I'm not uncomfortable, then I don't need a comforter. That's a good word right there. <laughs> See, the Father has created you with incredible gifts and talents that are perfect for reaching your sphere of influence. Are you good at loving people? Are you good at making sure that people feel cared for and protected? And, and do they have what they need? Are you, uh, are you the person who defends people you care about? Guess what? That's called pastoring. you got the gift of pastoring. Go do some pastoring. You have a place in the kingdom. Uh, are you good at giving advice? Are you the person who always has the, uh, the right words to say? Are you the person that is good at seeing what someone is going through and maybe even speaking to it in a way that goes beyond your own comprehension? Amen. That's called prophecy. Maybe you have the gift of prophecy. You have a place in the kingdom. Are you outgoing? Are you like Joel? So, I mean, y'all need to meet Joel. I'm telling you, you don't need Joel. <laughs> don't ask him a question unless you want to get, like, altar call, offering, like, <laughs> great to go, man. I'm telling you. Way to preach. It's awesome. I love it. I love it. Are you an extrovert? Are you outgoing? Do you love being the life of the party? Do you love getting out there? Do you love meeting new people? Do you love people making people feel welcome? Do you love being the person who stands out in a crowd in order to share what's on your heart, whatever that may be? Because if you are, maybe you're an evangelist. That's called evangelism. You have the gift of evangelism. You have a place in the kingdom. Are you smart? Do you like studying stuff? You like helping people understand things? Like when there is a, a situation where something doesn't make sense, are you the person that they come to in order to help like people understand that? Because maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you have a gift of teaching. And if you're that person, you have a place in the kingdom. 
Are you the person who is good at organizing people from lots of different backgrounds, from lots of different talents, lots of different abilities? You're the guy that's able to pull somebody from over here, from over here, from over here, to say, you fit here, you fit here, you fit here. Guess what? That's called apostolic. You may have the gift of apostleship. You have a place in the kingdom. Do you realize that in everything that I just mentioned, I probably like mention every single person in the room? Everybody fits into the things that I just told you about. Every single person. And guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I can't do them by myself. Dave can't do them all by himself. Carol Lee, Tennille can't do them all by ourselves. We need each other. Because I guarantee you that every person was represented in the things that we just talked about. Because everybody has a place in the kingdom. So guys, here's how we're going to release the kingdom. By understanding that we've been given gifts and talents and natural resources that God wants to empower by his Holy Spirit. Every single one of us. The days of the organized church and career pastors being the only answer are over. Amen. And the new apostolic kingdom driven body of Christ is rising up. And because of that, we're going to see our city transformed Amen. in the name of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? <laughs> but it's going to take every single one of us. Like you hear me on that, right? <laughs> if you're breathing, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, you don't have an excuse. Sorry. <laughs> you're in. I'm drafting you into kingdom ministry. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> Everyone has the ability to make a difference in their sphere of influence. Maybe your sphere of influence is your family right now. Good. Go get them. Win them. Show them what Jesus looks like. Maybe your sphere of influence is your work. Awesome. Love well. Don't be a jerk. Do your job really, really good. And if you can't, like, honorably step down. Like, go do something else. Because we represent a king from a greater kingdom. So let's make sure that we make him look good. Right? right. <laughs> Would you put out your hands? Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you that here in this place today, we have everything we need in order to see this world completely transformed. Jesus, I look around the room, and I am completely blown away by the fact that you were able to do it with only 12. And we struggle to wonder if we're capable of changing the world. We got a whole lot more than 12 in the room this morning, Jesus. So maybe we'll change several worlds. I don't know. But here's what I know. Your king your kingdom has come. And Jesus, you are an amazing king. Father, you're the best father that any of us have ever had and ever will have. And people need to know that. Sons and daughters need to come home. People need rescuing. Lives need to be restored. Hearts need to be won. The get ready words are over. The time is now. Jesus, we thank you for the way that you've been showing up in our worship services, for the way that you've been making yourself known. We thank you for the electricity that's in the air. But we realize it's for a reason. We realize that it's for a purpose. We realize that if we do nothing with it, it's going to die. So we ask for the, 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 the very clear assignments as we go about our day. And if the assignments aren't clear, let's just make assignments. Let's just create opportunities Amen. so that the world would know who you are, that you're a good father, that you love your kids, and you will stop at nothing to see them come home. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching this message from Dad's House Church in Yakima, Washington. Be sure to check out dadshousechurch.org for other videos and more exciting information.